Excellent. So thank you again for inviting me to the session. I will give you um, a brief intro into the topic and uh, particularly focus on do's and don'ts in that space. So you can expect five do's and five don'ts, which are in conjunction. So uh, let's see uh, what you say about this. And uh, I'm keen on getting your use as uh, questions afterwards. So um, what we do, I already briefly outlined, we are an information security consulting company uh, now also uh, with technology development in in house um, and yeah identity and access is one of our key focus points so when you talk ssi you usually have to do with lots of players in uh, in the global ecosystem and i've uh, just brought to your attention here on that slide what our ecosystem is so you see things like sovereign in the center which is basically the pioneer in the self-sovereign identity and the decentralized identity world. And we have been with Sovereign for many years now, and we also are operating a node in this uh, in this uh, identity network. And uh, this is still the the productive network, which is based on Hyperledger Indie and Ares technology, and uh, many people are using it already uh, today. And we base our attention on this uh, currently. But there is others which is coming up, and I will come to that in a second. So SSI for Germany is a project uh, launched by Mine Incubator, uh, in, which is a subsidiary company of Commerzbank, and you see here the consortium members. So SSI for Germany is a project that is under the umbrella of secure digital identities in Germany. And this is a project by the Ministry of Economic Affairs. So the federal ministry is sponsoring this project. And this is currently in the competition phase which means uh, that from 11 projects which are in the competition phase three or maybe four will be uh, selected for being executed for three more years and we are very hopeful with all the partners that you see here that we will be able to continue this uh, uh, for the next three years so the first uh, do's and don'ts is basically believe it many people worldwide are already working on and with self-sovereign identity and uh, Germany is uh, currently one of the powerhouses in the space. So we have uh, a couple of very interesting projects uh, dealing with self-sovereign identity. But obviously, this is a very um, global topic. So uh, Germany is is now uh, on on a well on a on a rush and and on a spree to actually implement self-sovereign identity. But believe it, many worldwide are working on it and with SSI. So don't underestimate the momentum self-sovereign identity has gained so far. So we are we are eagerly working with everyone in the space globally, but Germany and uh, also broader Europe are, are on embarking on rolling out SSI. So lots of projects and don't underestimate the momentum SSI has already gained. And uh, we'll see how that, uh, uh, what role that does play for you going forward. So, Actually, we are undergoing an evolution of digital identity, and you see here that we have uh, we have traversed through a path of centralized identity with vendors in that space. We have moved to federated identity, which is still very much at large at this stage in the in the whole enterprise industry, and uh, we are moving towards more user centric uh, identity, which has worked out for some quite nicely. However, the future is, is there with a self-sovereign identity and the players that you are, you are seeing here, like, like Sovereign and Uport and others, which are in that space, um, show that we have technology at hand to make decentralized identity really happen in the world and uh, um, being ready for broad adoption. So the, the next uh, do's and don'ts combination is you should embrace the future. It's already there. So the technology is there even if you are still um, having uh, rolled out certain other solutions in your in your organization be aware um, the technology is coming so it's uh, it's there and you can already get in touch with it today so meaning you can uh, in fact leverage it already for your for your processes and backend uh, tools so don't think it's just fashion and it will go away it it won't so this is uh, the, the future of digital identity. And um, as you all probably are aware in the identity and access space, this has been an, um, a clunky and cumbersome world for, for enterprise organizations. So with self-sovereign identity, we have a great way 
of uh, going into the future and uh, do some good stuff with that. So the key takeaway that you always have to keep in mind when you talk about self-sovereign identity is what you're seeing on the picture here now, the trust triangle and verifiable credentials. So if you have never heard about this before, you probably are well aware of many processes which are based on an issuer and an owner and a verifier uh, construct. So what does that mean? You usually have as, a, as an identity holder the situation that you need to prove certain facts about you. And these usually are not self-attested facts, but they come from some kind of issuer who says that you are something or you have something or um, you have a certain capability. And then uh, when you use it, you need to present it to the verifying party because he wants to see some certain proof of attributes about you and he trusts the issuer already because of this existing trust relationship. So very, very simple example is you have a driver's license which is issued by the driver, driver's license agency and you come into a, a police control and the police officer asks you to show your driver's license and you show it and he sees that it has been issued by the right issuer and you are the eligible holder of it and he believes that you are um, able and licensed to drive a car. So you see that we have many, many um, situations globally uh, where you have such a triangle. So someone attests certain facts about you, you need them to, to prove uh, that you are eligible uh, to have these facts and uh, the verifier needs them for, for doing an assessment for himself. So there's many examples worldwide uh, where exactly this trust triangle comes into play. And in the self-sovereign identity world, we work exactly with this trust triangle, meaning that we have um, a, method, a method which is called verifiable credential, which is holding this facts. So the issuer is not uh, just giving you a, a document as a PDF or an email or whatever, but he's giving you a verifiable credential which holds this information. And this is cryptographically assured that you are um, that you cannot forge it and the issuer is the right issuer and uh, you can always uh, tie it back to the issuer. And uh, this is the, the key piece in, in the self-sovereign identity world. We don't uh, work on, on just documents and, and data sets. We work on cryptographic trust. And this is exactly the advantage that we're having with self-sovereign identity. So it's not just identity, but it's about secure data exchange as well. And you see here on the right hand side, we have a zero knowledge proof capability, which means you can selectively disclose attributes from such a credential. And you can also um, uh, disclose only derivatives of the uh, information. So exa for example, if you want to prove that you're over 21, you don't have to disclose your, your birth date. You can just disclose uh, true or false as an answer. So this is the basic construct that you always have to keep in mind. This is SSI. And this is cryptographic trust in a digitalized world. So what should you do? You should look for use cases in your organization and, and, or in your, uh, rea your own personal realm. Um, there are a lot of opportunities to work with such a trust triangle. So if you keep your eyes open and have this in, in the back of your heads, you will always see, oh, this is an issue or owner verifier relationship. So this is something for SSI. So what actually uh, is, is a... Um, is the contraposition to that. So don't believe SSI is just for others, not for you, because you, you will see when you walk the world with open eyes, there's tons of use cases with exactly this triangle relationship where you can benefit from SSI. So how do you now employ SSI? This is, was now more or less a theoretical debate, but uh, there is a way to build a bridge between self-sovereign identity and uh, the legacy world. Uh, well. Legacy is maybe a, a bit hard, so it's the classic identity and access worlds. You will, you you will have tons of different applications and data source which with, which uh, work with certain protocols and standards today. So what you can do with self-sovereign identity is you can build a bridge between self-sovereign identity and this classic and existing world, and uh, this is quite easy to achieve because you can talk. Uh, to the standard authentication authorization protocols that applications leverage today, like SAML or OAuth 2 or OpenID Connect, or for authorization the same, and also LDAP type uh, directories like an Azure Active Directory or an Active Directory or just some uh, open source uh, LDAP uh, system. So you can build a bridge between this SSI world and uh, this uh, classic world 
by um, building a bridge between them with a technology uh, gateway, so to say. And this is something that we have created um, as as a piece of software, which is uh, here called uh, as, as self in the in the in the in the diagram. The the key thing is you have to have some kind of institutional agent which talks to the ledger, and this agent can in fact add this value add functionality uh, that I've just uh, described that you can translate between self-sovereign identity attributes from credentials and translate them into protocols that your applications already talk today. So if you have identity and access management in your enterprise, you have an existing problem. So the do is start with the problem that you already have and integrate SSI. So what, what this doesn't mean is what you don't have to do that you have to throw out all your old technology. It's not necessary and also not wise because you can just seamlessly integrate bits and pieces with a self-sovereign identity. And if you traverse through your own investment cycle, you can roll out SSI to many more applications as you move along. So you don't have to throw it all out, but you can start easily with a problem that you already have today. And I know from my, my experiences in large scale projects that big enterprise organizations have an identity and access complexity problem and uh, an investment problem there. So this is something that you can start with certain areas. This is what you should do and you don't have to declare everything else obsolete yet. So what's the paradigm shift we are talking about here? So um, it's a little bit provocative SSI rules. Uh, what do the rules mean? I will come to in a second. Um, what, it, what it basically means is, is that you don't have to have dedicated access concepts, joiner mover, lever processes, and approval workflows anymore because you can just work with a fact-based identity and access management, which means that authentication and authorization decisions are based on facts. So this means that you, as the, as the um, SSI person, you have a digital wallet where all this data about you is, is in your, your digital wallet. You can have it on your smartphone, which is the common way today, but it could also be some kind of cloud agent that you control. And we define a rule set which determines if you are eligible to access a certain uh, data store or application with the, the facts that you have in your wallet. So for example, we could say, everyone who works at Kopinger Call is eligible to work at the, uh, to access the Kopinger Call Wiki system, which may be an Atlassian confluence or something like that. So you can easily derive based on the facts that someone is working at Kopinger Call, he's eligible to access the Kopinger Call Wiki system. So that's, a, that's a, a very interesting use case already and shows that you can work with the verifiable credential attested facts that uh, someone is eligible to authenticate. So this is a very, very common and, and broadly used use case today uh, that you have to authenticate. And this usually relies on username password or a single sign-on solution. But now you can tra transform this into a fact-based uh, authentication mechanism, which relies on credentials that the user has in his wallet. So Kuping a call would issue a credential to the person uh, who is working uh, for, for the company. And uh, with this credential, which is a proven fact, you can derive access decision. And the same way it works for authorization decisions. And you also see here, we are moving away from role-based access control to more something like attributes-based access control, or you could also call it policy-based access control. In the credential world, we call it uh, credential-based access control, which is based on the rule engine that um, you can put in the middle uh, and in front of your, your applications. So the final set of do's and don'ts is cut complexity now. The SSI technology is ready, so you can move away from access concepts, join a mover, lever, and approvals. You can definitely reduce the complexity significantly here and uh, and work with, with a set of rules, which uh, allow you to uh, perform um, access control based on facts. And you don't have to prolong the suffering. The nightmare was too long already in the identity and access world. So if you want to move ahead now, the technology is there. So you will have a way out of the complexity nightmare that current IAM systems usually are. So this is uh, basically the, the five do's and don'ts I wanted to offer to you. And I'm, I'm keen on listening to your comments. And if you have further questions, I'm looking forward to answer them. So thank you.